Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to what is now the 38th edition of the Coffee Microcaps Morning Meeting. Um, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps for anybody who is joining us for the first time. And for our regular attendees, welcome back to another event. Uh, I'm just going to quickly run through these introductory slides and then we're going to get straight into it with our first presenter. Uh, for anybody who's joining us for the first time, um, companies that uh, generally presented these morning meetings, uh, the criteria is that they're under 300 million in market capitalization, that they're in revenue and approaching kind of cash flow break even, or indeed already profitable. And they're companies from outside the resources uh, and biotech sectors. Uh, so what we like to call uh, coffee microcaps, industrial microcaps, which spans a whole range of sectors from uh, microcap tech, healthcare, financial services, uh, niche retailers, in industrial engineering and products businesses, uh, I guess a, a broad gambit for what we would define as an industrial microcap. Uh, the structure of the presentation this morning, uh, we have two companies presenting. We run these every fortnight, but more recently, we've been running them every week, uh, over an hour. Each company gets a 30 minute presentation slot, which is broken down into a 20 minute presentation. And then we'll throw it open to a live Q&A for the last 10 minutes. If you do have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box rather than the chat function. And the Q&A box just, uh, or the Q&A function just makes it easier to moderate the questions at the end. Please note that the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel tomorrow morning. So if one of our presenters does happen to skip over a particular slide um, a bit too fast, you can watch it back and indeed you can watch back any of the other presentations in this series on the YouTube channel. Um, where can you follow Coffee Microcaps? You can get us on Twitter, YouTube, as I said, for the recording of this webinar and all the previous ones, LinkedIn. I also write a weekly paid subscription newsletter where I highlight one interesting ASX microcap stock every week, which can be found on the Substack newsletter platform. Uh, first up this morning, uh, and indeed our two presenters this morning are actually companies returning to Coffee Microcaps to give us an update, having uh, presented a few months back. Uh, I'm delighted to say, first up, we've got Carl Rudd, CFO of Osteopore. And then our second presenter is going to be Mr. Philippe Boudoir, CEO of Xtech. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I am going to hand over to Carl, who I know is patiently waiting for us. There we go. I can see the cover slide of your presentation, your card, so you're good to go. Thank you, Mark. And I'd like to thank uh, all the people listening in today who are interested in, in osteopore and interested in the update. It has, um, I checked up yesterday, it's been a year since we uh, last appeared, I believe, with Jeff. And uh, quite a bit has happened in the interim. So, um, you know, what I'm, I'm going to do today is present a summary of who we are, what we do, um, look into the compelling product technology that we have, our competitive advantages. Um, and then I'm also going to uh, discuss our strategic imperatives, which are accelerating our revenue growth first and foremost, diversifying the scope of application for our products, and uh, also the continuous product and process innovation that drives better patient outcomes and uh, hopefully that also more, you know, with a target of being more effective at doing that. Um, just first, a uh, quick note from our legal team that uh, I need to remind everybody that this presentation may include forward-looking statements. Um, we at Osteopore believe that these statements are based on very reasonable assumptions of what we can do and what we can achieve. But uh, I do need to tell everybody that our actual results may differ. And I would encourage everybody to have a look at our ASX filings for a discussion of the risk factors um, that may cause these uh, material differences. So with that said, um, let's get on with what Osteopore does. So 
We conduct research, we design, develop, manufacture and distribute a unique 3D printed implantable scaffold that facilitates vascularization to accelerate bone and tissue regeneration. So that's quite a mouthful. We'll unpack that a little bit more as we go along. Um, I would like to note that most of our core product variants are CE marked and have US FDA 510K and Australian TGA clearance. And to date, our scaffold has been applied in around 50,000 procedures, 20,000 of those over the course of last year. Um, the biomimetic scaffolds are made from the same material as dissolvable stitches, uh, polycaprolactone, and are naturally and predictably resorbed by the human body over a period of time, which leaves the patients with only their own natural healthy bone. Um, we differentiate, we like to believe that we differentiate ourselves quite significantly from many other small and micro cap medical device peers, and that osteopore has already embarked on its, in, on its journey to expand into global markets and generate revenue. Last year, we uh, achieved sales of one and a half million dollars, growing 41% in constant currency terms over 2019. Our core products, osteoplug, osteomesh and osteostrip, are primarily indicated for use in over 1.1 million cranial and maxillofacial procedures, which are conducted yearly. And we compete for a share of the annual total available bone graft and permanent implant markets, which are estimated at 3.9 billion and 100 billion US dollars respectively. Uh, osteopause uh, produces all of its products, including the patient specific implants using a proprietary 3D printing technology in-house in Singapore. Um, and the necessary 3D printing equipment has already been purchased and installed in the company's clean room. So we will set up to, to drive that, that increase in volume over the coming months and, and year or so before we need to expand. Um, as the use of our core products don't require any changes to the current clinical procedures, they are very easy to micro adjust in the operating theater for a better fit and result in exceptionally low post-operative complication rates, um, we can see that this technology is, is positively impacting patient outcomes and also contributing to lower healthcare system costs. Um, the scalable uh, opportunity that's available um, in, in terms of the, the serviceable available market is around 1.1 million cranial and maxillofacial procedures, which are conducted worldwide every year. And um, our standard products um, offer us a significant opportunity to improve surgical and aesthetic outcomes for patients. Uh, the standardized nature of many of these procedures and the easy customization of osteopor uh, osteopause products allows for um, manufacture and distribution at volume um, and storage in the hospital's inventory system. Um, and we uh, can complement st these standard items that we produce with patient specific implants for larger repairs. Um, so that presents the uh, surgeons with a very diverse set of, of solutions based on the, the same underlying technology. We, um, at the moment, are particularly excited by the opportunity to expand in Europe uh, following the notification of the European Medical Devices Directive, um, in which uh, they certified a significantly broader range of products. The CE mark has been extended to include all osteomesh, osteoplug and osteoplug C sizes, as well as seven new shape variants. And the, the number of listed shape variants um, increased from three to 10 uh, through these, um, the, this, this expansion. And the additional designs allow for access to an estimated uh, 100,000 craniotomy cases per year, um, especially to bridge fresh craniotomy cuts created with associated surgical instruments as well as to accommodate standard therapeutic devices. 
the uh, um, the expansion in, in MDD certification also means that access to osteopore products in Europe has grown from around 110 on indication procedures to an estimated total of 210,000. Uh, so 110,000 to 210,000 uh, on indication procedures uh, annually. And based on our market research, we estimate that the serviceable available market value of the incremental access afforded by this extension exceeds $115 million. Um, of that, Germany and the UK account for just over 40% of the European market, which is expected to grow to 255,000 procedures per year by 2025. And in addition, this expansion has also um, allowed us to extend the shelf life of, of osteopore products from two to three years, which de-risks it then um, for, for a lot of hospitals as we roll it out. So all of our products are manufactured with a porous interconnected microarchitecture that is very similar mechanical properties to human cancellous bone, that's the spongy bone. Um, and once implanted, blood and cells are absorbed, absorbed into the scaffold pores through capillary action. And this creates a regenerative environment that is ideally suited to tissue formation. With revascularization, osteoblast activities start to resume, the cells migrate and proliferate, and in that way, regenerates the bony tissue in the scaffold. And as the body completes this natural healing cycle, bone healing cycle, the implanted scaffolds are resorbed over a period of 18 to 24 months in the form of water and carbon dioxide, which leaves the patient with only their own natural healthy bone at the end. Um, our standard products, um, Osteoplug, is available in a range of different sizes and is designed to snap fit perfectly into the post trephination burr hole to provide patients with outstanding functional and aesthetic outcomes. Um, Osteo Mesh is our most versatile product with diverse applications in cranio and maxillofacial as well as aesthetic procedures. Um, the product is really easily customizable in the operating theater using surgical scissors and a warm saline bath. Um, and osteomesh has proved particularly effective in repairing orbital floor fractures. And the clinical research suggests that the use of osteomesh shows an improvement in outcomes when compared to permanent implants. Osteomesh is also used in corrective septoplasty and aesthetic rhinoplasty procedures. Uh, osteostrip is an integrating implant to restore surgically created bone def defects in craniotomy. This implant is used to fixate the bone flap after surgical intervention and assists healing by bridging the gap between the bone flap and the host bone. Um, we at Osteopore also collaborate with a number of surgeons around the world to produce patient specific implants, uh, what we call PSIs. And this is to repair bone removed because of disease or accident. Most commonly, these PSIs are developed to replace larger cranial areas or sections of the tibia. And recently, well, probably about six months ago now, a few of the Australian procedures featured prominently in national media on Channel 9's A Current Affair. And if anybody's interested in really the human side of, of what we do and the impact we have, I, I can recommend looking uh, for those uh, videos uh, on Google. Um, they really are worthwhile watching. Uh, in Singapore, uh, uh, scaffolds have regulatory approval for dental application and they are really generating revenues. Uh, more work is required in other countries to complete clinical trials as part of the regulatory approval process but we're very excited about the potential growth that this product should contribute once uh, it's available for sale in the major markets. Our work on orthopedic art implants is also advancing steadily and investigative devices are available for use in approved clinical procedures. In addition to 
the <coughs> um, work we're doing in the dental and orthopedic space, um, our exploratory work continues with alternative standard shapes, in particular uh, modular inserts for uh, long bone repair. So to have those, instead of fixing long bones with a patient specific implant, we're looking at, at ways of um, creating a modular insert that can be um, added. You can add inserts together to get to the right length. And we're also looking at wedges for procedures that uh, uh, related to hip and knee adjustments. Um, and in addition to all of this, we've also observed very encouraging results in the application of our scaffolds uh, in regenerating knee cartilage in animal trials and are at a point now where we can progress that to get uh, the ethical uh, ethics approval for in human trials. So um, if we get to one of the um, key issues and, and key advantages of osteopor products, um, it's definitely around the, uh, the, the improved patient outcomes and lower risks. So traditional bone graft and permanent implant procedures um, have much higher incidence of post-operative complications. Bone graft procedures create secondary surgical sites with the usual associated risks and um, are more prone to causing patient discomfort. And the success of bone graft procedures is not always guaranteed. Um, there is quite significant potential for the body to absorb the graft without uh, generating any bone regrowth. Um, similarly, permanent implants associated with much higher uh, rates of post-operative complications. And some of the materials used are far more difficult to micro-adjust in the operating theater during the surgical procedure. So <clears throat> our implants are highly customizable um, and have proven to be effective in around 50,000 procedures to date with extremely low post-surgery complication rates. Um, so we're looking, you know, in our case of around 0.01% versus um, a, you know, 6 to 19% uh, complication rate with bone grafts and 25 to up to 33% in terms of permanent implants. Um, so <clears throat> the, you know, in, in summary, um, I'd say that the, the use of osteopause products don't require any changes to the current clinical procedures, are easy to micro adjust in the operating theater for a better fit and result in exceptionally low post-operative uh, complication rates with the technology positively impacting patient outcomes and contributing to lower health healthcare system costs. Um, a little bit on the numbers. Uh, we had sales of $318,000 in the quarter ending March 2021, growing at 21% in constant currency terms over the corresponding period in 2019. Uh, our gross profit was $217,000 for the March quarter, representing an increase of 29% compared to the same period last year. And the first quarter gross margin of 68.2% was achieved. So that's an improvement on both the 56.3% in the corresponding quarter last year and the 63.2% achieved for the full 2020 year. We have a tight capital structure with a limited free float. The top 20 shareholders hold over 65% of the issued capital and board and management hold around 21% of the shares on issue. Um, and at the end of the March quarter, the company had a cash balance of around $7.9 million. And over the course of the last four quarters, an average quarterly operating cash burn of $468,000. Um, this is significant, we feel, and that it positions us well to focus on and invest in driving revenue growth over the next few years. And to do that, mostly through expanding the distribution network. Um, we've been very challenged over the past 18 months um, through the, uh, you know, the, the circumstances that have prevented um, opportunities to provide the necessary training and support for distributors and surgeons. 
despite, but despite all of the challenges presented by COVID-19 restrictions in most countries, we managed to expand from 13 to 23 partners last year. And, uh, and we do definitely expect that as the COVID-19 vaccination programs roll out globally, our access to these critical partners will improve and sales will grow. The uh, distribution process begins with um, our identification of suitable distributors who have access to surgeons who conduct procedures in the areas in which our products are relevant. Um, the next step we take in that is to train these distributors and surgeons, making sure that the accumulated knowledge of all of those procedures to date is passed on to ensure that the best possible patient outcomes are achieved. Um, this whole process can take anything from three to six months um, and the COVID restrictions in, in this case um, started off by uh, preventing travel. Um, we, we couldn't get out, we couldn't get our teams out and about uh, to access distributors and surgeons. Um, then the access to surgeries was limited to essential personnel only for obvious reasons. Um, and then the hospitals also started to defer elective procedures to manage capacity. Um, and all the while, a positive out of this for, you know, in terms of societal outcomes, by um, a, having an impact on, on our product, is that as people were um, restricted to staying at home, um, there was a natural decline in accidents and incidents that result in injuries that may require our products. So um, we definitely, the, this uh, combination of, of, of effects um, definitely hasn't uh, led to uh, an ideal, the ideal conditions to expand our, uh, our network. But uh, to date, we've, uh, you know, built successfully uh, within Asia, especially those countries that were uh, last year not particularly uh, badly hit by the, uh, the waves of the virus. And primary amongst these countries are South Korea, Vietnam, and Singapore. And most recently, we have a very good relationship with um, LMT Surgical here in Australia um, to, to build the Australian business. So excluding Australia, which came in late, Asia grew at about 39% over 2019. Um, and <clears throat> Uh, you know, that was supported by sales of product used in a range of different clinical procedures, including aesthetic surgery. Uh, in the near term, osteopore is going to, going to continue to develop the dental application in Singapore and beyond and support this with clinical trials for orthopedic applications in, in all of the Asian countries. Uh, we also look forward to continue to grow our sales here in Australia. Um, and in addition to the wider adoption of patient-specific implants, we excited about the opportunities to conduct clinical trials for dental application in Australia as a precursor to obtaining TGA clearance. The uh, priority markets that we uh, are looking to expand into um, outside of, of our cornerstone markets um, include uh, Europe, uh, for obvious reasons that I've, I've covered already. Um, last year, we signed distributor agreements for the US, uh, for, for Germany and, and Austria, the Scandinavian countries, and uh, we've expanded that into the Middle East as well. And currently we are engaging with interested surgeons in the UK who are evaluating our products. Um, and we've also got through the, uh, the work of re-registering our products in the wake of Brexit. Um, we've begun to make inroads into China, initiating the establishment of a, a subsidiary in Shuzhou Industrial Park as a prerequisite to obtaining the necessary regulatory clearances for our products. Um, this is a really time consuming process and we don't expect uh, these approvals within the next two to three years. Um, but given the significance of the Chinese market, they have more than 200,000 cranial maxillofacial procedures every year, um, we recognize the importance of working 
in that space uh, towards the necessary approvals as a key driver of future growth. Um, we've also uh, initiated the search for potential customer, uh, uh, distributors in Japan with strong ties to, to hospitals and surgeons specializing in the craniofacial procedures that we're interested in. And as soon as uh, a suitable partner has been identified and engaged, we'll begin that regulatory process um, alongside uh, the education and training. And uh, we, we look forward to, to establishing a foothold in Japan as they account for over 120,000 relevant cranial surgeries every year. In the USA, we have our agreement with Bioplate, which covers a few of the uh, US states. Um, that now, as the US is emerging out of the uh, COVID pandemic and business is more or less returning to normal in parts, um, we are seeing an improvement in our business there. And we're also looking at uh, engaging with another distributor to make sure that we can cover those states that aren't covered by bioplate. So, um, you know, things are on the up both in, in Europe and, and the US. Um, our, you know, in summary, our commercial priorities um, are really, uh, you know, with, with regards to our strategy rests on these three complementary paths to drive growth and add value. Um, First priority is, is really to accelerate revenue growth based on existing products in the core and key expansion markets. Uh, second, we're actively exploring and validating new clinical applications for our technology with a focus, with the initial focus on obtaining uh, regulatory clearance for dental and orthopedic applications in Australia, the USA and Europe. Um, and third, we are committed to innovating products, both in terms of, of, of new uh, polymers and, and uh, polymer combinations, um, but uh, also in, in terms of production methods and organizational processes to continuously improve patient outcomes, simplify the surgical tasks and reduce healthcare costs. So um, here is a list of the, the sources that uh, uh, I cite, especially with regards to the clinical uh, uh, results and, and, and uh, complication rates that might interest you. And I think that all that remains to be said from my side is thank you for your interest in osteopore. And uh, I trust that the presentation has informed you of our progress so far this year and provided an indication of, of what we expect to, uh, you know, as news uh, for the business over the coming months and quarters. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Um, I've got a couple of questions. That's kind of two questions that are probably linked together and um, that were emailed in ahead of time relating to the manufacturing facility in Singapore. Um, is the plan that the Singapore facility would manufacture and export globally? Uh, and Or do you need to at some point set up localized manufacturing beta on a regional level, you know, a Europe uh, site, a US site, or Australia site. And then the follow on question to that is, what's the current capacity at the Singapore manufacturing facility? Um, so currently we uh, manufacture and export exclusively out of uh, Singapore. But that's a question of, of, of scale. Um, the more, you know, as we grow, um, there will be, uh, you know, the opportunity to look at manufacturing product uh, closer to the patients. Um, and this may happen in, in areas where we see a concentration, for example, of uh, patient specific implants. Um, so our technology lends itself to uh, producing uh, anywhere really. Um, but at the moment, as I said, it's a question of scale. Um, we are in a position to meet, you know, according to our plans, the demand this year and probably well into next year before we need to think about expanding into other jurisdictions 
um, as a result of volume. But uh, that said, there may be opportunities to um, test this first and validate the process um, in, in the realm of, of patient specific implants beforehand. And we're just pushing up on time, but I'm going to squeeze this uh, other one in quickly. Um, uh, for expansion into Canada, um, the question is, could it, can this be covered by Bioplate or uh, an additional US-based uh, distributor? I would be looking at an additional US-based, US or North American-based distributor for Canada. Okay, that's great. Carl, we're just slightly gone over time and I know Philippe is waiting patiently in the wings. So uh, thank you very much for your presentation and your time this morning. Um, and thank you for stop sharing your screen. And now we, if we can just get Philippe to start sharing his screen, uh, we can get into uh, Philippe's presentation. Thank you, Mark. Bye. Thanks, Carl. So Philippe's uh, presentation should be coming up now. Oh. Trying to find it. Uh, okay, one, uh, no problem, Philippe. coming through now, Philippe, if you just go to uh, slideshow mode or full screen mode. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Uh, that looks great, Philippe. Thank you. Sorry for that. No problem. So you're so ready. You want... Yeah, you're ready, ready to go whenever, whenever you're ready. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, um, good morning and thank you for, uh, for your interest. Um, XTEC is a uh, listed company uh, on the Australian Stock Exchange. Um, uh, Tigger is uh, a uh, XTE, and um, I'll go straight into uh, into this. You know, we can read the disclaimer. But um, so, what what do we do? Uh, we do world class soldier soldier solutions. We uh, we not in in uh, medical. We uh, we mainly in in defence. Uh, and our specialty uh, is um, working for uh, soldiers in general, providing soldier solutions uh, on one side, on the ballistic side. So we, we provide helmet, hard armor, soft armor, shields to, to, the, uh, to the soldier using our own technology that we will, we'll go into in a few minutes. And we are very much as well in unmanned systems, very small systems, uh, flying systems, like the one that you, you can see on that, uh, on that picture. Uh, that we supplied to the uh, to the Australian Army, and then ground vehicles. Uh, you can see the, uh, uh, the the blue one is a uh, an explosive and ordnance disposal. Uh, the uh, the green one is a uh, is a new addition, which is a uh, much larger UGV uh, unmanned ground vehicle um, that uh, we distribute, and uh, we'll see you know how we sort of make it uh, happen and and how that you know provides complete solutions. Uh, uh, in terms of sensors to shooters uh, system, which is uh, putting those two uh, those two specialties together. So, uh, going into into the ballistic side uh, first, um, we have a, a very well defined strategy. We have a, um, uh, um, a a process that you can see on the first one uh, that is uh, the the, uh, um, the result of about twelve years of uh, of R and D, uh, which is um, you know to make parts that are you know, uh, lighter than, um, than you know, what is available on the market. But if you have a process that doesn't give you uh, cash in the bank, basically, um, you need the process on one side, but then you don't sell the process, you sell the products coming from it. So we've developed a number of products and uh, we're adding new products all the time, um, which you know, is, is very important. 
And then you also need manufacturing capability. It's all fine to set up the product, but how do you manufacture it? So we've uh, set up that factory in, uh, in Adelaide. It's fully operational now. Um, and of course, the, the last uh, bit that is necessary is have distribution networks and, and major customers. And uh, uh, we've started this um, a while ago, but uh, the whole thing was launched in, in um, officially uh, about three months ago. We have uh, a, a very wide distribution network, including a subsidiary in the US called Hycom, uh, which we bought about 18 months ago, that is uh, making and distributing uh, armor products. And therefore we have a, uh, an, in, an inroad into the, uh, the biggest market in the world, which is the US in that particular case. So where are we located? We have, uh, we have about 45 uh, different um, uh, distributors across the world. Um, we have, uh, we're probably covering um, um, about a, uh, a dozen countries, a bit more probably, uh, mainly in Europe and in North America, uh, a bit in the uh, Australia and the uh, Asia Pacific as well. Uh, so we can, we can really cover, you know, uh, a, a wide range of, uh, of the, uh, the market that we can address. Remember that uh, what we do is not available to uh, uh, some of the, uh, the, the, uh, the middle of the, this picture. Um, like Russia or China, uh, are not are not in. Uh, we can't export to these uh, to these countries. Uh, they they uh, uh, well for obvious reasons. So we have networks that are well established, and um, um, uh, the the biggest one, of course, is uh, is the network that Highcom, our uh, subsidiary in the US, is actually uh, uh, has and uh, um, uh, distributes across um, North America, basically. Products uh, well. How do you qualify them? They're the world lightest. It's it's probably a good qualification for this, which is really giving us the uh, an enormous amount of uh, our you know unique uh, selling point is really that it's very light. Uh, so we do plates, um, hard armor plates like the the one that you can see here, which can be up to thirty percent lighter, um, and uh, we use you know the um, the Guardian brand, which is uh, the uh, the Hycon brand in particular, uh, which is much better known than, than what we are. And we do, uh, of course, composite helmets. Uh, this, um, in particular, a helmet that can stop uh, AK-47 bullets. Uh, it's not very well known, but 99.9% uh, .9 of the helmets deployed in the world don't, don't stop AK-47 bullets. 30% uh, of the, uh, the uh, uh, injuries, uh, lethal injuries that happen uh, in the US in the past uh, 10 or 15 years have been uh, uh, head injuries. And they have, I mean, everyone has helmet that doesn't stop AK-47, which is the main, the main threats that uh, you know the uh, the Western world is having uh, to fight against. So having a, a helmet that can stop it is actually a, a, a very massive, a very massive advantage. Um, we um, we have a number of other products. Highcom uh, uh, supplies up to about a thousand other products of different uh, different kinds. You know, carriers, soft armor. Uh, different accessories that you can dream of. So we can actually, uh, within the within in-house, um, sell complete systems, um, helmets, soft armor, hard armor, carrier, or any combination thereof uh, that we can sell to directly to a customer, or could be done and sold to a um, um, a prime contractor, a local prime contractor for final integration. Uh, if necessary. So we can adapt it depending on the, the requirement of local content in particular uh, to provide, you know, other simple, simple finished products as well as complete systems uh, using or not the local, the local resources if necessary. So that, that is a very important uh, factor because uh, otherwise it, uh, it would limit our, our capacity to sell, you know, quite, quite uh, uh, stringently. So uh, what is that technology? Uh, well, that, that's uh, the machine, how it looks. You can see the, uh, you know, the, uh, the size of that uh, uh, machine. Uh, you have a, uh, um, uh, a, um, um, a pressure vessel in there, which um, um, where you put you know, about 40 plates or about 20 helmets at a time. And uh, that actually, uh, after an hour and a half to two hours of cycling, uh, will uh, will give you will give you a product so so that machine can uh, can produce you know a fairly large amount of uh, fairly large amount of product. So uh, this is a ultra high isostatic pressure composite curing and consolidation technology. You can see here the uh, the pressure vessel and the the plates that are about to get in. 
Um, the uh, the concept of it is you um, you uh, you put the plates into that pressure vessel that you can see there. You close the door. You pressurize the whole thing at 300 bars. You circulate um, um, a fluid that gives you uh, raises the temperature. And after a, um, uh, a certain amount of time, you have a, uh, um, a plate that is constantly heated, ready to go. What, why is it so interesting? Why is that technology so unique? Uh, well, it's quite simple. As I said, it's isostatic. That means the, uh, because it's a, a liquid that is transferring the, uh, the pressure and the temperature, the pressure is exactly the same in every part of the, uh, of the, the plate or the, or the helmet. And the uh, characteristics in terms of uh, ballistic stopping uh, is dependent on uh, the pressure that is applied at any, at any point in the particular uh, part that you, you, want to, uh, to, you want to use. So if it's uh, applied in an isostatic way, which is exactly the same everywhere, that means uh, the whole plate, every or the, the helmet at any, any part of the, uh, the, uh, the part uh, has the same capacity to stop a, a, a bullet. And of course, the bullets don't choose where they, where they land. Uh, they uh, they can land anywhere, so uh, the uh, capacity to stop you know is actually enhanced quite quite substantially compared to other uh, uh, technologies such as pressing, for instance, uh, actual press, which doesn't give you the same uh, the same uh, uh, isostatic pressure and therefore not the same capacity to stop you know in a consistent manner uh, because you never know where the where the, the round will come from. So that that's what is uh, you know very uh, very interesting in terms of. Uh, uh, and, and really unique in terms of what uh, uh, can be done. No one else is actually using that particular, that particular technology. So the exclave that you can see here is now in, uh, in production. Um, it's a large commercial exclave, uh, which uh, is, has been in production now for about three months, two months about. Um, we have successfully completed the first contract with Finland, which is, was worth about $2 million. Uh, uh, we started it with uh, a, a smaller machine before, but it's, uh, we finished it off uh, in the last six weeks or so using, using that commercial machine. And we're delivering uh, uh, day in, day out plates um, to the US and law enforcement market uh, that is addressed by our subsidiary in the, uh, in the US. Uh, the focus has been recently very much on the US sales. Uh, the, the full commercial launch was, was started in, uh, in, uh, in the US in March. We had uh, pre-launch and, uh, and uh, uh, sensitivity uh, um, uh, analysis done on the market for the past uh, year or so, but that was fully commercial, uh, commercially launched in, in March. Capacity of that uh, factory is about $40 million a year at this uh, uh, Australian um, uh, manufacturing center in Adelaide. And uh, we're preparing a, uh, um, a way to sort of uh, supply another machine to the US. Uh, which will uh, be located in our subsidiary there. We have a, you know, already a manufacturing capability, so it's a, an additional machine there. It doesn't you know, change the, uh, the, uh, their, uh, their capability at all. And, uh, but we, we think that that might happen towards the, uh, the end of next year. So that's on the, uh, that's on the, um, um, on the ballistic side. On the uh, action with intelligence and unmanned vehicles, uh, that's the other bit, which um, as well as the, uh, the, the, the ballistic, we have our own IP uh, that is uh, uh, enshrined into it. Um, that is, uh, uh, that IP is actually um, uh, a, a, um, a, a software called Xatlas, uh, which is an, an actionable intelligence solution. Uh, what it does, it actually takes the, um, a video from a, um, uh, a UAV, typically a small UAV, the sort of things that I showed you before, which is small, you know, about 1.5 kilos, about 45 minutes endurance. You take the, the, uh, the video from that and you, you create a real-time accurate and geo-referenced uh, 3D mapping from that video. Uh, that gives you a, a map that is uh, completely up to date you can compare it with previous data that you have stored in, in a database with you. Uh, you can see how uh, you, know, you have a real-time and home situation of awareness that have happens for, for it. Uh, we interface it with existing hardware and uh, we've uh, recently added uh, artificial intelligence into this, uh, which um, uh, allows you to uh, recognize objects and, and people uh, within the pictures that you're getting uh, so that you can analyze who um, uh, who is a enemy, who is a, a friend, what is a, uh, a a truck that is uh, uh, on the wrong side or a, an armored vehicle on the right side. So you can actually distinguish 
very clearly who uh, who you should target or not. You can actually uh, even look at uh, at uh, a group of people and determine if some have weapons and others have not, um, and be careful not to sort of uh, kill uh, a group of people with a, uh, a hostage in the middle or, or these kinds of uh, these kinds of situations. So it's a very very powerful thing. Uh, we get into artificial intelligence in a, in a very massive way at the present time. And I think it's a uh, uh, it's really the future. That's what uh, uh, defense needs. Uh, but you know, for us, it's a uh, it's it's part of an existing product that uh, that we are enhancing with uh, artificial intelligence. So that's how it looks. Uh, um, um, you can see here the sort of uh, um, uh, two uh, UAVs, for instance, that are um, uh, showing some uh, pictures. Um, in the uh, in in and you have a, a little encrustation with the, each of the with the, the visualization of it, and you can see here that uh, if you um, if you um, uh, it is a three D model here it looks like a flat uh, uh, area and you can see that when you produce, you process this, well it's not that flat at all it's it's actually you know a three D uh, very uh, uh, very difficult terrain, and uh, suddenly, by having that processed by uh, uh, our software, you can see that you can you cannot go through even with a good armor vehicle with trucks and everything. So it's a uh, it's a uh, something of, of great of great interest. Uh, we've gone even further than that um, as we. Uh, um, um, through the concept of uh, tracking and targeting. Uh, now we have a possibility with a UAV, you can see the UAV that is in there. Uh, you can get you know, a picture in an unmanned manner. Uh, you process the data using that uh, uh, software I've just described. And because it gives you a very large, uh, a very good accuracy of uh, each pixel you, know, you, you have in, in your real time uh, 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 picture, you can pass that on to a, uh, a weapon or a UGV with a weapon and actually have, have a full sensor to shooter uh, chain uh, on an unmanned manner. Uh, you know, sensor to shooter is something that is uh, fairly standard in defense, but have it on uh, picked up from an unmanned U UAV uh, to an unmanned uh, a remote weapon station on an on a, un unmanned uh, ground vehicle, that is completely unique. And uh, we're talking about, you know, a, a sensor to shoot the chain that is uh, worth uh, probably a fraction, about one one hundredth of the cost of having a, a manned uh, vehicle um, uh, giving a, a target to a, a manned uh, armored vehicle on the other side. So that that is absolutely massive in terms of uh, in terms of potential. We had a demonstration, uh, so you can see here what it how it works. Uh, the UAV gets into the into the sky. Uh, it will pick up a particular target, as you can see here. It's a it's a truck. Uh, follow it on the, uh, on the on the on the road. Uh, passes on the information to this UGV that we represent, and a remote weapon station that uh, we work with in a company called EOS, also EOS existed. And you can cue then the uh, the remote weapon station in that case a, a thirty millimeter cannon, and engage the target. You know, uh, completely unmanned again. So you know a revolution in the uh, in terms of cost and in terms of uh, of protection of uh, of soldiers that is uh, you know completely uh, completely uh, uh, completely new and, and really uh, exciting. We had a number of uh, presentations done in the last few months when uh, we went to the Land Forces con Conference in uh, in, uh, in Brisbane um, and uh, presented that to the uh, um, to the uh, to defence. I mean the uh, up to the top of the uh, top of defence, the uh, the chief of the uh, Chief of Army, uh, they were absolutely wrapped with the concept. So, um, how does that work um, uh, business-wise? We uh, we're part of a uh, of a um, uh, development that we uh, we've under we are undertaking together with uh, EOS and a number of other Australian company called C4 Edge, uh, which actually create the environment that described. Uh, we are providing the uh, the main application, which is the sensor to shooter application that described it a few minutes ago, into a much larger program that is uh, that is now uh, uh, funded, and we've got about a million dollars worth of um, of um, contracts into this. Uh, we've signed this MOU with uh, Athena AI, with um, uh, object recognition and identification I, I mentioned before, to try and see uh, the people you see on the ground who they are and you know, whether they they are. Uh, Good, bad, or indifferent. 
Uh, we are representing Air Environment, which is the uh, defense contractor specializing in unmanned aerial vehicle. We've, uh, uh, we have a, uh, an exclusive arrangement with them. We've uh, signed a contract for uh, nearly $50 million with, uh, with the Army. And we now maintain those, they've been delivered, but we maintain those uh, you know, quite efficiently. And we have a number of other uh, opportunities in this. And we have the uh, a representation for this Milram Robotics, for this uh, unmanned ground vehicle. Uh, which um, you know will gradually um, uh, also add some uh, parts for us. We're going to provide a uh, uh, armor for for that particular vehicle from the, the ballistic capability that we have as well. So you can see we have uh, uh, we can sell the complete chain, some with our products, others with uh, with uh, uh, partners. But at the end of the day, we uh, we can have a, a complete subsystem, a manned subsystems with artificial intelligence to sort of do this sensor to shooter uh, uh, concept. Other opportunities, um, we, um, we, uh, we have uh, um, done a number of things in terms of space. Uh, the Exclave is actually a, um, a very good in terms of um, uh, the technology that it provides to sort of do uh, a, a much higher strength uh, to weight ratio. Uh, which uh, you know other technologies won't won't provide. It also reduced the composite outgassing, which is an enormous problem in space. And uh, you know from that we've uh, signed a, uh, a partnership with uh, with Skycra, which is a um, a small um, spacecraft manufacturer in Canberra. We have a joint statement of strategic intent with the Australian Space Agency, and we've signed an MOU with a, uh, a French company doing uh, called Mecano ID to pursue international uh, space market opportunities. They, uh, they supply uh, a number of systems, uh, space systems. We would provide a number of parts to these systems using our technology. They recognize that it is uh, you know, making a, a major difference in terms of uh, weight in particular. For space, weight is everything, um, but you know, we're in the weight business, so <laughs> that's absolutely right. Outlook for the company, well, uh, the company has been uh, uh, on the stock exchange now since uh, 20, 2005. Uh, because we were doing a lot of uh, distribution before, uh, we had a, uh, a reasonably slim margins. Uh, a lot of the work that we're doing and we've done by having our own um, um, products, we, uh, we basically uh, are increasing the level of margins that, uh, that we can propose. And so the, the, the target that we have is to sort of uh, shift from proprietary products, and you can see in the, in the pie chart that you, is shown um, on to the left. In gray, we have low margin distribution in FY20 uh, for about 75% of our, of our turnover. Uh, maintenance was about you know, 10%, and the, uh, our own proprietary products, it was about 25%. The first half of 21, uh, we've uh, uh, jumped to about two thirds of the, uh, the turnover in uh, in uh, uh, proprietary products and uh, high margin products, uh, system integration, um, about 20% uh, in uh, repair and maintenance and 20% in low margin distribution. And in the medium term, we'll probably stabilize on that. We, we're not going to, to give up uh, all the distribution, uh, the part of our you know, uh, system integration uh, that, that are part of our solutions, but most of the, uh, most of the, uh, the turnover will be uh, uh, coming from high margin uh, on one side. And that's a combination of ballistics on one side, um, uh, through the, uh, uh, the US or, or through our global network, uh, our, you know, uh, actionable intelligence solutions, repair and maintenance, of course, and uh, increasing opportunities in leveraging uh, XCAR for advanced composite solutions like, like space. Our target in the medium term is probably around 100 million with gross margin of about 30%. And, uh, uh, it's looking, it's looking, uh, we're on the right track uh, uh, to sort of achieve that. Uh, we well funded through an equity raise we did in uh, 2020 and, uh, and some debts that uh, you know, we got from different banks, which is uh, uh, also very, uh, very healthy. And so uh, we're looking at the future with uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of confidence. Um, we, um, key upcoming catalysts, we, we need to deliver the, uh, the ballistic plates to the Finnish defense, which uh, is now done, so that's a big tick. Uh, get to the US ballistic orders now with, with the launch and marketing of uh, additional ballistic products, on, which is ongoing. Uh, we need to sort of uh, sound up a number of other countries. We have uh, 
a number of distributors in Europe, Middle East, and APAC, but uh, we need to sort of sign up more, more of those. But you know, overall, we already have 45 you know, worldwide, which is you know, very, very significant. Uh, we need to deliver the final phase of C4H program, the one that the program that uh, we are undertaking with uh, EOS and uh, the, the Australian government for the uh, sensor computer uh, system. Uh, we need to install, commission, and optimize the, uh, the US uh, xCloud machine during uh, the, the next calendar year, sort of uh, to be able to have a second machine. Uh, if you have a machine in, in Australia with $40 million uh, capacity and uh, another one in the US with uh, $40 million capacity, that gives you already 80 million. So we're 80% of the way to, uh, to the, the target of 100 million. Uh, well, remember, this is capacity. We still need to sort of book the orders. <clears throat> Of course, complete our space project in partnership with Skycraft, but um, uh, but we can uh, that that's well underway. We, there are other discussions we have other international parties. Space is very very popular nowadays, and when you have something that uh, makes a difference, uh, we should we, we expect that to be to be successful, and continue to achieve further commercial orders for XDCloud products, supply and maintenance of uh, of UAVs. There's a, a fair few UAV uh, programs that. Uh, uh, we're pursuing uh, very actively, and uh, that should become uh, successful in the not too distant future. So, key investment highlights: um, the uh, we have a very favourable defence market sentiment. Um, uh, the West is actually uh, investing a lot more in defence in a uh, in a strategic environment that is uh, uh, a bit a bit more risky than before. We focused on market leading soldier solutions, so we we're not doing anything else. Um, we have a U.S. expansion accelerating ballistic solution strategies, which is, you know, uh, obviously getting into the biggest uh, market in the world is uh, uh, in a massive manner that we do, uh, is a, uh, a key to success. Uh, we have actionable intelligence software interfacing with unmanned systems um, and, and artificial intelligence, so we have something that is really tangible that is recognized by defense, and a very strong pipeline of opportunities and near-time catalysts. Uh, not only do we have uh, uh, smaller uh, uh, programs uh, with, uh, with the US, but we also are bidding for much larger programs in, in the rest of the world and in the US as well. So, um, you know, we are quite hopeful that the company will be, will be successful in the next time, in the next few years. Thank you very much. And uh, um, if you have any questions, here is my contact. So um, just... Uh, um, any any questions at this stage uh, thanks we haven't got any just at this minute from the audience but i have a few that were emailed in ahead of time um one was a question on the i'm not sure if i'm pronouncing it correctly the the vera lens uh distribution agreement that you signed in march and i didn't mention it in your presentation um did um question was they just wanted an update on where you are in terms of the uh, I guess TGA regulatory approval and I guess getting set up to actually start marketing and getting sales of, of that new product line. Um, well, it's not exactly a new product line. We, uh, we've been doing uh, uh, similar products in, in, uh, in terms of distribution for, for years and years. But that product is actually very, very interesting because it gives you a, uh, a COVID uh, test in 20 seconds. And probably a, uh, a way to sort of detect the, the virus uh, two or three days ahead of PCR. And uh, so it, it could be of, of great interest. Uh, it's presently uh, with DGA. Um, uh, as you're probably aware, it's very difficult to sort of uh, talk too much uh, or promote too much uh, of, um, um, of these kinds of products before you get DGA approval. But you know, we can talk about it in general terms. Uh, we we we're expecting that any day uh, we have some stock ready to ready to sell. We have a distribu distribution network that is fully in place. Uh, we can be we can be uh, 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 on the ground testing in the, in the next uh, you know within days after the, um, the the TGA approval. So yes, it's very promising. We uh, uh, we believe it's going to be very successful. Uh, we tend to be uh, a bit shy in terms of uh, talking about it because uh, um, TGA is not very keen to sort of uh, uh, hear people like us, uh, you know, promoting it in a, in a, in a massive manner. Uh, but, you know, when, when we have that, I can tell you, you'll hear from us you know, a lot. <laughs> okay, great. So it's, it's, it's basically in the, the kind of regulatory approval um, 
workflow and we uh, it's just a way it's just a matter of, of letting that process uh, roll through okay that was that was one of the ones then the other one the uh, uh, it says a concerned shareholder uh, couldn't join but once uh, is worried about how come uh, your USJB partner seems to be selling some of the shares they received as part of the agreement he, he wants to know are you helping them uh, place that stock in the market rather than having them uh, I guess sell on market is their, is their question No we um, yes yeah, so uh, one of our biggest shareholder is uh, the people that sold us the uh, Highcom Armour uh, uh, subsidiary we now have. It's uh, it's a it's a hundred uh, percent owned by by Extec, but uh, the uh, Highcom Global was called uh, uh, was a company that actually sold us that uh, was paid partly in script um, in uh, uh, at the time about two years ago. So uh, yes, they've been uh, they've been selling uh, their um, uh, their shares. Uh, not because they're not interested. I mean, they were. I mean, when they sold Highcom Armor, you know, we knew that at some stage they would get out because uh, you know if they sold it, that was they had no no real interest in the in the uh, in the in the business in general. Uh, so the answer to this question is yes, we're helping them a lot uh, to sort of place this. Um, uh, my understanding is that they basically have uh, no shares left, but uh, of course that was about four million shares that came onto the market in. In the last couple of months, uh, and although we had, uh, we've managed to sort of uh, find a number of uh, counterparts, basically here in Australia uh, and overseas as well, um, that has affected the other share price quite uh, quite substantially. Um, they are basically out of the uh, uh, of our of, of our register, so um, you know we uh, that that should have an, a, a positive impact on the uh, on the share price. Okay, and then in terms of the. Uh, products that you're sending to the to the US currently, uh, the question is, are you just still sending the plates or is it now a combination of plates and helmets that you're you're sending across from the Adelaide facility? So at this stage, we uh, uh, we selling we're sending mostly plates, but we sell uh, a number of helmets as well. Uh, so the quantities are really in plates, um, but we have a number of uh, uh, testing sites with the, the U.S. Department of Defense uh, uh, for for our helmets, and so uh, we'll start uh, shipping helmets in larger quantities uh, in the next couple of months or so. Okay, great, Philip. I just realised we're gone slightly over time, so I'm just going to going to leave it there. Thank you very much for for coming back uh, and giving us an update on everything XTech and. Um, We'll uh, be keeping an eye out for further updates on all the various business lines and divisions that, uh, that you've got going on. Thank you very much, Mark. Have a good day. Have a good day, everyone. And then I wish everybody else a good rest of their Thursday. And thank you for, for joining this uh, latest edition of the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. Okay, thanks, everyone. Thank you.